My most stressful moment was just basically just missing your family. As a single soldier, I didn't really have, you know, a wife and kids, so I basically just was on my own. I never got, like I said, a chance to deploy, so I don't know that kind of stress. But as far as being in the military, the more positive you are, the more positive input you put, you put in, the more positive, you know, you'll get back. Although I was stationed stateside in Charleston, South Carolina, there were times when we were subjected to stressful situations. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, we were on call 24 hours a day. And just living in the hospital complex itself, dealing with uh, body bags coming in every day and caskets going out, um, there were wounded soldiers that we had chow with every day. Um, I dated a young man who had no face. And it was um, not something that was, we really didn't consider it stressful. It was part of our job. It was part of what we did. And we just coped from day to day. I have been exposed to uh, a lot of stress within the military community and within the military world. Uh, and just like uh, any soldier does at one point in time. Me trying to readapt to all that craziness, all that, all that anger, all that excitement, all that adrenaline. And coming back home to where I guess it's more calm. It's, it's, it was very stressful. It was just something I wasn't used to anymore. I was part of the 82nd Airborne Division, which had for every one female, it was like 15 males. Being in the combat zone, being in the 82nd, also being around the infantry, the artillery, the tankers, and all those people, it just, it, it had me involved in more things that I didn't expect I would be, you know, being that I'm supplied, I'm supposed to be in the warehouse. No, we're on trucks, we're on convoys, we're picking up soldiers, we're picking up supplies, we're taking care of, you know, everyone, basically. And so anything that's not there, we had to make sure that we had to get. And so it was just very active day. I mean, it starts off from four in the morning sometimes, depending on when the trucks come in, till whenever the work is done. We do not leave until the work is done. So it could be one o'clock the next day. And so, but yeah, it was very, very hard. I was exposed to stressful experiences um, from the moment I arrived in Vietnam um, because as we were disembarking from the plane, they, they were receiving incoming rounds at the moment I got there. And everybody started running in all different directions and I didn't know where to, where to go or where to, where to run. I just followed the crowd. Fortunately, I followed the right crowd. All right, because they were headed towards a bunker, which really worked out well, and I was totally okay. Um, um, and that was my, my, my orientation to Vietnam. And so at first, um, I spent a lot of time believing I was not going to return for many, many months. And, um, you know, um, that transitioned about halfway through my first tour when um, the, the commanding officer said, I really, really, need a um, driver and so I became the commanding officer's driver for the last half of my first tour in Vietnam um, and he was an expert Vietnamese linguist so we would be going into the villages all the time and stuff like that and part of the stress that I, I, I was exposed to with that was that you know I got to really see what poverty was really like I thought I was impoverished as a child I got to see what poverty was really like um, I got to see how people behaved when they were impoverished. You know, um, you couldn't stop and not watch your vehicle because they would take parts off of it while you weren't looking. Um, you know, um, people were starving. It was really, really a very painful experience that I, I, I'll never forget. And so I understand poverty. From the day I started till the day I got out, I found it stressful because it's not a natural lifestyle. I mean, when you have to constantly dress the same way every day and salute people whom you don't have much respect for, in the most part, for the most part, uh, when you have to uh, stand in line for your meals three times a day, uh, it's pretty stressful. Just just the day-to-day -day military lifestyle, unless you somehow are psychically adapted to that kind of stuff. You, you find that comforting. It's stressful too to fall asleep every night listening to outgoing uh, artillery fire. The other thing that puts a lot of stress on you is that your 
You're not fighting for your country. You're not fighting for the people back home. You're not fighting for freedom. You're not fighting to save the South Vietnamese uh, from communism. You're fighting so that you can go home and the people you're with get to go home. I would say the most stressful part of being in the military was definitely the year that I was in Iraq. You just, you see things that you don't want to see, or you're, you're not that you don't want to see it, you, you're not, they don't, you're not prepared to see the things that happen in war. Like, you don't grow up, you know, watching bodies getting blown up or, or whatever. And, that, and you see that stuff over there. You see bombs dropped, and then you have to clean up the mess from the bomb. You're pulling arms out of rubble, and it's, it's horrific. I mean, I wouldn't wish that stuff on my worst enemy ever. Um, you know, friends get killed or get injured or whatever the case may be. And that's, I still think about some of the guys I was with over there that they didn't get to come back with us, you know. I mean, their body did, but they're not here anymore. So, that, that is definitely the most <laughs> stressful part. Yeah, I have been exposed to stressful experiences, and I think those that uh, those of us that say that we haven't are hiding something. And prior to going to the Middle East, I met uh, a girl through a friend of mine, and uh, we hung out, and you know, I got to know her just a little bit. And then um, I was two months from, actually three months from coming back here to the States. It was in August, and uh, a friend of mine had asked me. If I needed a care package sent to me, what do I need? I was like, are you kidding me? Like, send me the world. Like, send me magazines, Twizzlers, like, you know, anything that seemed trivial to someone else. Like, I just even a rock from my front yard, like, I wanted it, you know? So she said, okay. My friend sent me the package, and in the package was um, a little stone that had the word faith on it. And out of the whole package, as much as I was excited about those Twizzlers, like, I was more excited to see that because that meant the world to me, like that someone actually sent me a rock or a stone that said faith on it because I started to lose faith as when are we going home, like what's going on, you know, and the next day I called a friend of mine, another friend of mine here in the States, and she sounded upset and I said, well, I said, what's wrong, why are you so upset, and she says, um, she said, I don't know if I should tell you. I don't know if it's appropriate. You know, maybe I'll wait till you get home. And I said, no, tell me now. And she said, uh, Hinkley was killed yesterday. And like, I was dumbfounded. And the thing that choked me up the most is because her name was Faith. So I got that rock. Actually, my package was delivered the day before she died. So, you know, I held on to that, you know, I still have it. And, um, you know, I didn't know her very well, but I came in contact with her. And I knew that she was like the type of person, she was such a good person, and she's 23 years of age. And she made everybody laugh, and she was like the most positive person ever. And it angered me, and I actually became obsessed with her death. Um, I didn't sleep. Uh, for months, um, it took me eight months to almost a year to be able to sleep. Um, if I slept three hours in a day, a whole 24-hour period, that was a lot. Um, how I even survived on that much sleep, I have no idea. I would get third, fourth winds, you know, and just move on with my day. Um, I would go on YouTube because I couldn't be, nobody, I was still in theater, I couldn't go to the funeral or anything, and so I'd go on YouTube and there would be this news reporter from Fox News, and he was um, laying on the ground and speaking to the camera about how a, a, a rocket had just hit and a soldier died 400 feet away from him, and as he's reporting, and all I could think about was that with Hinckley, the 400 feet away. You know, and you go through things like that, and you don't necessarily have to like be somebody's best friend. You know, just the contact. I mean, we're all each other's brothers and sisters, and it just it takes you to a different place uh, in your life, like somewhere really dark. And if you're lucky to find your way out, 
and you have a good family and a support system, then you're lucky. Um, I had a great family and support system, but I chose to push them away because I felt like they didn't understand um, that they were invading my privacy um, and that uh, nothing they could say would make me sleep, would make me better. And recently, I, the past four months, I've actually been able to sleep. Uh, my way of sleeping when I came home was taking Benadryl and down, drowning myself in alcohol so I didn't have to think or I could just be knocked out. And, but then Benadryl wasn't working. So then I had to do something, so I went to the VA and I said, look, I need help.